song and uses the word uh, yonder. Some of you have a hard time understanding that kind of lingo, uh, but the, some of us that are from the South, that's part of their lingo. Uh, and I say from, I'm from the South. I was born in Texas, uh, but uh, I guess most, most all of my life was lived here. Uh, but I do remember my grandfather, my mom's father, uh, using that word quite often. Uh, yonder. Let's go out yonder. Uh, let's go uh, uh, put a, uh, on the fishing boat with the catfish and, hey, let's go up yonder and try that area. Or uh, squirrel hunting. Hey, let's go over yonder. We'll, we'll see if we can catch some, uh, shoot some squirrels from over on that side. You know, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, but, hey, you know, the thing about heaven is very universal. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, um, uh, nationalities of Americans that will be there, all right? Uh, the South, the North, the East, the, the even, I think even some Californians are going to make it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to be interesting. We're going to the book of Revelation once again. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 is where we're going to be uh, looking at here this morning. Revelation uh, chapter 20, again, I am... I am just so grateful for those of you that are, are faithful to uh, being in the house of the Lord, being at church. Uh, I know this whole uh, COVID thing has really disrupted so much in regards to uh, meeting together. And I still have people uh, just, uh, it seems like on a consistent basis, uh, asking, hey, is your church meeting together? Are you guys uh, doing uh, services and things like that, and, and, and I'm always grateful to be able to say, yes, uh, we actually have been meeting together for several months now, and oh, our church still hasn't started uh, back meeting in person, we're trying this, we're trying that, and and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really thankful when uh, the things of religion and Christianity are real and come from the heart. Uh, this, the, the, these things like the days that we're living in, this really tries the facade of religion. Uh, if you have something out here on a shell and this is, you are because this is the way you grew up or this is because of uh, your family or your parents or this or that, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold true. Uh, but when it's truly of the heart, it's a different situation, a different scenario. And I'm just, I'm really, truly joyed with those of you that, uh, that it's so real that it's just like, miss church? I couldn't miss church, you know, and unless there's a reason that I can't get there of some sort. Uh, but uh, I, I would encourage uh, all of us uh, uh, just to can't hang in there and continue on with that because we want to be found faithful when the Lord returns. And uh, if you're watching the news, if you're listening to any of the sermons, the messages, if you're paying attention at all, uh, you're constantly seeing just almost daily reminders uh, of how close the rapture really, uh, really is and, uh, and how soon it can uh, occur that, that quick. So I hope you're ready for that. Revelation chapter 20, we've talked about so many different uh, aspects uh, of of the end times. Uh, we've talked about the rapture and the uh, judgment seat of Christ. We've talked about the marriage of the Lamb, which, by the way, I had a thought uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was, I had a thought about, you know, we really ought to, ought to be considering this time right now is uh, us as the bride uh, adorning ourselves and and beautifying ourselves and, and getting ready. And when I say ourselves, obviously it's the work that Christ does within us, right? Uh, but when you think about it, uh, and I'm, it's kind of on my mind because of the last few weeks of weddings and, and still trying to get to past all that, you know, but uh, one of the things that certainly uh, emphasized uh, any, uh, the day of any wedding is uh, the bride adorning herself. And uh, getting ready, and 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 many a, a bride has taken hours and hours, and and uh, sometimes many days before and weeks before, you know, building up to that to make herself uh, as beautiful as possible, uh, so that that first look uh, when her uh, uh, soon-to-be husband sees her, you know, he just melts and falls right there, uh, standing and just uh, you know that kind of. But we ought to have that same mindset towards Christ. Lord, I want to be as beautiful as I possibly can for you. I want our church to, to, 
to really uh, allow that uh, truth to, to permeate our life and helping us get rid of those impurities and having uh, the beautiful aspect of righteousness uh, uh, through our life uh, lived out so that we're ready. Uh, but and also, we, we've talked about uh, the tribulation and uh, the, uh, then the, the great uh, second coming of Christ. And, and last week, we looked at the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And what a time uh, here on the earth that is going to be uh, when Jesus reigns. But let's pick this up here in chapter 20 and verse 7. Uh, chapter 20, verse 7. Everybody okay uh, as far as the temperature? It feels like it's kind of the lull in the, you know... Too warm? No. No? Okay. Well, the first time I see eyes go like this, I'm putting the air conditioner on, all right? So there's a motivation to <laughs> keep it up. I hate asking that question because I know there's always going to be five different answers, all right? But uh, don't let the warmness uh, lull you into a stupor because uh, I know sometimes just the sitting still, you know, one of these times we got to try, one of these times we got to cha uh, change um, swap places. I'm going to sit and you're going to stand uh, Why? Why I preach. I don't know if I could do that, but, you know, that might just, uh, anyways. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. Here's what the scripture says. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 uh, and verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired. A thousand years seems like a long time. And uh, I can't even possibly really fathom a thousand years because, you know, uh, uh, 10 years seems like a long, and when you're younger, you, you know, a few days seems like a really, really, really long uh, time. But a thousand years, when the thousand years is expired, and that's going to bring us then into uh, this next event for the, uh, what we would say is the end times. And that's what we're going to focus here this morning on, the great white throne judgment. The great white throne of judgment. And this is a, a one of those that uh, in studying it, again, I have been more uh, uh, just reminded and, and it's been reiterated to my heart uh, how important it is for you and I to truly consider uh, the condition of the lost. And, and if you get through this message and you're lost, uh, I trust the Lord will convict you and bring you to true salvation in Jesus Christ. If you are saved, I trust this message will convict you and bring you to the true conclusion that we need to become more dedicated than ever before of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we see here, this time has expired. Now, this time that expired uh, was the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This time was essentially a utopia style, if you will, uh, of, of earth, uh, just like heaven here on uh, this earth. Now, it wasn't completely the same as heaven's going to be. There's uh, definitely some key differences. Uh, one of the biggest ones of those is just being that there's sinners here uh, on the earth. But Jesus Christ is reigning. Uh, he is the one that's in charge. He's the one that's in control. There's a lot of things that, that are going to happen from a creation standpoint that are going to put it back into uh, some of the original uh, design uh, that God had when he said, let there be these different things. Things like uh, the lion and the lamb laying down together eating hay versus the lion eating the lamb. Uh, those kind of things will be evident and, and, and just the, uh, the lifespan will increase and, and just the, the peace that will occur uh, throughout the entire world and, and especially as it has occurred on the end of the tribulation, the tribulation of seven years and all the devastation that took place. Now the opposite has been ushered in and for a thousand years this is how life uh, has been experienced. But as we see here, there is a final stand that takes place. And that's the first point of the message this morning. The final stands. What happens uh, here in the end of verse 7? Uh, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. 
uh, uh, this is, uh, again, remember, uh, as we talked about the beginning of the thousand years, one of the things that was so, uh, uh, you know, just delightful is to recognize the angel now has the key to the bottomless pit, and he casts the devil into it and locks it up, and then uh, the devil's chained in the bottomless pit for these thousand years. And you almost be just kind of want to be like, man, how's that devil? Take that. You know, I hope you enjoy that thousand years because I'm going to be here uh, ruling with my Savior. I'm going to be here experiencing a life without you. And that's going to be a blessing. But at the end, uh, Satan's going to be released. And you say, why? Why is the Lord doing these kind of things now? There's always purposes in what God does. And we don't always get to question or always understand them. Uh, but I think if you step back for a moment, you will realize here why Satan is being loosed out of his prison. But, but again, one of the things I think is so delightful about that statement is that he was bound in prison. <laughs> uh, and that's just, uh, there's, uh, that's amazing, all right? But when we consider here, he says in verse 8, "...and shall go out to deceive the nations." which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Uh, and now I want you to recognize a few things, and we'll read a couple other verses here in just a minute. But, but in this final stand, uh, one of the, the facts of life is that sin, the sin nature, is still in existence. The sin nature is still in existence. Now, it's not those of us that are raptured believers. It's not those of us that have the glorified bodies. Because in a glorified body state, we will not be able to sin. But if you remember, those that survived the tribulation, that had trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they were ushered into the, the, the millennial reign of Christ, right? They were ushered into uh, this uh, 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 kingdom of Jesus. And in that kingdom now, uh, they are still on the earth. They are still in a, in a body where they can have children. And so they, uh, you, you think a thousand years and you think of expanded life frame, their lifetime, we have the opportunity to repopulate this earth quite a bit. I mean, just think about Noah's day when the Lord wiped off everybody except for those eight souls. And think about how quick uh, the, the population came back. And here during this time frame, it'll be even faster. Uh, there'll be plenty of, uh, of just the perfect scenario, perfect setting for uh, children to uh, be born. And so we have this whole uh, 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 multitude of individuals that are born on this earth that are still born with a sin nature. Now that part is, it's, it's almost uh, uh, hard to really understand because when you consider the things that are going on, you know Jesus Christ has come and He's the one rolling and He's the one reigning and He has set His foot down uh, on Jerusalem and the Bible says that He's rolling with a rod of iron. So essentially, he is really like we are forcing righteousness to occur. Uh, unlike what today and uh, the, the way that we live or our society, uh, you know, the, the popular thing is unrighteousness. The popular thing is the things contrary to the things of Christ. Now, not in this thousand millennial uh, year reign of Christ. It, it's, this is not the way it's going to be. Righteousness will be the popular thing. Then when you add in all the, the glorified saints and the angels and, and those that are ministering and the, the disciples and different things that are happening, David that's ruling, I mean, uh, you've got a lot of great things happening, great things occurring. And so the sin is not going to be as uh, rampant. It's not going to be as prevalent. It's not going to be as open, but the nature is still there. In fact, Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 20 says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. So this is during the millennial reign of Christ. This is a prophetic uh, uh, passage of scripture come from the book of Isaiah chapter 65. It says, For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be a curse. So there's still sin nature. There's still individuals that are humans that 
uh, have a sin. Now we also recognize a little bit uh, from the fact of the uh, the new t- uh, temple that will be ushered in and the sacrifices that will be occurring on a consistent basis during the millennial reign of Christ. Those sacrifices are occurred for the purpose of these with a sinful nature to recognize that Jesus Christ has come. Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb. Jesus Christ paid uh, for the sin of the world. So they still have that. Of course, all the uh, the preaching and things that will be uh, occurred and going on. But then as we consider this, uh, Satan being loose, he comes out of the bottomless pits and it says there that he is to test the hearts of those that were born during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And that number is as the sand of the sea. And so here what we see, look at verse 9. Uh, it says, I'm sorry, uh, verse yeah, verse 9, And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, and the devil that deceived them, the devil that deceived them, Here, the devil comes in. He knows there's this whole group of people on the earth. It's as the sand of the sea. So we're talking about a great multitude of individuals. He comes in and he applies uh, pressure to their sinful nature. And somehow they buy into it. And he leads them in a revolt against Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say that in my mind, that is really hard to fathom to a certain degree. Because as soon as you recognize the sinfulness of mankind, then you also can recognize how even in an almost perfect society, they still don't buy into Jesus Christ as their Savior. They still have that rebellious nature, and Satan comes along and plays to that, and they join into him, and join with him, and now we are going to have that, that final showdown, if you will, of Satan and the lost minions that he has coming against Jesus Christ. But it's not much of a battle. It's not much of a stand because as we see there in verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. So what happens is this battle, what happens is Satan comes in and gathers all these individuals together. We see our Savior destroy them. We see our Savior take the devil himself and cast him into the lake of fire. And at that point, his, his future is forever sealed. He will never be loosed again. He will never create any more chaos That is the devil's final stand. And today we must recognize that. We must understand that any time that you're tempted into sin, any time that you're tempted to to go the wrong direction, you need to remember the end. You need to remember what's going to happen with him. You need to remember how he's going to spend all of eternity. And you don't want to be on his side or anything to do uh, with him. And let me tell you something. It's as simple as this. The devil is a liar. And he's the father of lies. And you and I lie. We are following the devil. Now let that lies and the devil and all the other stuff that go along with it, let it be in the lake of fire, but let it not be in our hearts, in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So forever, Satan will be doomed. That is his final stand that is also those that were lost during the millennial reign of Christ that never trusted Jesus as their savior they also will be uh, killed they will be destroyed at that battle and then it leads us into uh, verse 11 here uh, where we start with the great white throne judgment and this is the final situation for all of the lost, the final situation for all of the lost. Look at verse 11. It says this, And I saw a great white throne. I saw a great white throne. 
and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written uh, um, uh, in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now let's talk about this event. Let's describe this event. Let's try to gain some scriptural understanding of this event again. So the information will motivate our hearts to be right with the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's salvation or whether it's soul winning or whether it's just scriptural living, these kind of things motivate us within our heart. The final situation for the lost, first of all, we see the judgments. The judgments, there's three three specific judgments that we have kind of uh, looked at and covered or we're going to cover here. Uh, first of all, we see the judgment seat of Christ. We've already talked about that. That occurs in heaven during the tribulation with those that are the raptured saints. That is a judgment only for uh, believers and it does take place in heaven. And it's, listen, it's for the fact of understanding the rewards that we will have according to the works. Now, I tell you what, after looking at the great white throne judgment, and understanding that even more so, I'm grateful to be part of the judgment seat of Christ. I don't like judgment. I don't like the word of it. I don't like standing before God. But I am, I am so thrilled that I get to stand before God in that way than in the way of the great white throne. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Judgment day is coming, whether you're lost or whether you're saved. Now, for the lost, it's a whole lot worse. But for the saved, we still have that reckoning and we ought to be living for Christ as much as we possibly can. Then the the judgment that we didn't really talk too much about, it's the throne of glory judgment. It's found in Matthew chapter 25 and and, uh, it happens there at the end of the tribulation time frame. Uh, Here's two verses that kind of correlate with it. It says in verse 31 in Matthew 25, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory... That's that return, that second return, that's the step, putting his feet on the earth uh, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. That's why we get the name of it from the throne of his glory, right? And before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from uh, the goats, and that's another uh, uh, term that has been utilized uh, uh, regarding this judgment, the judgment of the sheep uh, and the goats, and this is a, a judgment that occurs again at the end of the tribulation, those that have survived, we have some lost ones, we have some saved ones, and there's a, a few different thoughts on that particular judgment, uh, there's some that, that kind of lean more towards a nation judgment, or a judgment of nations, and that would be directly in relation to how they treated Israel. Uh, Those that treated Israel with blessing uh, will be blessed. Those that treated Israel with cursing will be cursed. But if you think about it in in, in so many ways that uh, uh, there's a universal principle of salvation and you're a sheep or you're a goat based on your uh, uh, choosing of salvation. Uh, The sheep will be those that are saved. They're the ones that, that know the voice of the shepherd, right? Because they're his. But then there's the goats, there's the ones that, you know, kind of went along with it, that maybe pretended to be a sheep or pretended to be of the flock, and they don't have true salvation in their heart, and they'll be set aside. And you know, here's the thing, the judge, Jesus Christ, knows clearly who is and who's not. You won't fool him at that particular uh, a moment or that particular judgment. That's for that situation. And also, again, dealing with some of the things in regards to the nation of Israel. We talk about giving a cup of cold water in the name of Christ and, and things of that sort. But then, as we see here in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. This is only for the unsaved. This deals specifically with one thing, and that's the rejection of Christ as the Savior. And this deals right after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. 
the location of this particular uh, 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 judgment. We see there in verse 11, we see that we have a great white throne. Uh, the significance there of the word white would have to do with the righteousness of Jesus Christ or the righteous living that we all are supposed to be uh, living. It says in Psalm chapter 9 and verse 7, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. You know, there's things that happen in scriptures and things that are stated in scriptures that are not coincidental. They are significant and we must recognize that our Savior is perfect and he will judge according to his standard of perfection. You know, one of the things that we are so tempted of to do in the world today is we are tempted to make our own standard for righteousness. We're tempted to make our own standard by which we should be judged by. We're tempted to look around and see, man, well, there's so-and-so over there and they're doing this and there's so-and-so over there and they're doing that. And I'm not near as bad as they are. And that could very well be true, but that is a skewed judgment as well as a skewed uh, system of judgment. Here, judgment on this particular situation at the great white throne will be done according to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It will happen in, well, we just don't know where. You say, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be giving us more questions, you're supposed to give us answers. <laughs> no, there's no location specifically uh, described. What we do see, though, is this. The earth and the heaven fled away. Explain that. I don't know. I just know it fled away. Peter talks about it being rolled up like a scroll. Talking about these things is being done. The Lord says, you know what? I I'm keeping it in place. I'm doing it until I'm done with it. And when I'm done with it, it's done. He's already taken care of all those that are lost. He's already judged uh, or he's already brought them uh, to a point of death through that last battle. So we know that they've already died. Now we're going to bring all of the lost up to a somewhere away from the earth, away from the heavens, right? Uh, the things that we know here. So where this is, God knows. And they're going to stand in judgment at that location. Uh, here, the, the, the lost, that they, they stand before uh, God. That's what he sees there in verse 12. I saw the dead. Small and great stand before God. So uh, here, this is this is what has occurring, and I don't think this is a uh, any kind of like. Well, there's a similarity here, or there's something that. No, I think this is really what's going to happen at the great white throne uh, judgment. The judge is Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, he is the one worthy of being the judge. Obviously, they stand before God. Jesus is. Uh, God and there's plenty of other scriptures that talk about how the day uh, of judgment will come the day of Christ judging uh, the lost now those that are judged again I've already mentioned it and I will continue to emphasize it it's only the lost that are judged at this judgment everybody understand that right those that are without Jesus Christ they're all unsaved individuals and not only are they unsaved individuals, they're all the unsaved individuals that have ever been created. So from the moment of Adam and Eve's creation until the last person is created during the millennial reign of Christ, every individual who is unsaved will stand at this great white throne judgment and be judged by Jesus Christ. The saved have already been resurrected. The saved have already been judged. The saved are already with Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I want to make sure to note, this judgment, the great white throne judgment, listen to me now, this judgment does not determine their eternal destiny. There is no opportunity at this moment to be able to enter into heaven. That's sobering. Because why? All the lost that are standing here have already died. 
So they stand there not to have their eternity determined, but rather to receive their final sentence. This is sobering. Think about it. And this is, this is where I struggled. I know people that are lost. If something doesn't change, they will stand before Christ in this judgment. I know people that are good people. But goodness is not good enough. If something doesn't change, they will stand before Jesus at this judgment. Do you realize the multitude of people that will be there? The Bible says why is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be that go there out. The amount of people that are going to be standing there is almost inconceivable. I couldn't number them. But I know the Lord will. It doesn't determine their destiny. But rather, it's the moment in which the sentence will be handed. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. This is a reality. This is a true event that will occur. And yet one that we wish was a different outcome. The witnesses, if you picked up there on verse 12, <clears throat> we saw, uh, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And notice here what's next. And the books, that's plural, the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things. Again, dead. Notice the dead because they've already died. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, when you study the scriptures, there, you notice there is a, a handful of books that are specifically mentioned. And there may be a few more than what I'll give you today. But uh, these are ones that are obvious. First of all, one book that is always mentioned is the book, the Word of God. The word of God. Do you realize they will be judged? And when I say judged by, essentially, what, do we, what we can we establish? If we're looking at a jury trial, if we're looking at uh, somebody standing on trial before a judge, there's usually witnesses that are called. These books are the witnesses. They will give testimony to in regards to why this individual is standing at this judgment. They will be the, the, the factual evidence that will demonstrate for all, why for all of eternity they have chosen to, to, to go to the place uh, of the lake of fire. The word of God in John chapter 12 and verse 8, it says, He that rejecteth me, this is Jesus Christ speaking, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now Jesus taught that when he was on earth. He taught that to the, the multitudes. He taught that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He taught that to the priests. And he taught that to the disciples. You know, and those, again, uh, that chose not to accept Jesus Christ. Look what they, they looked at him specifically. And one day, they will stand and they will give an account based on the words that Jesus spoke. The same words that you and I have. There's also the book of works. Works. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Romans chapter 2 verse 16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to uh, my gospel. When he says here in, 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 in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12, he talks about the things which they've done and being judged by those things out of thy book or out of those books. There's also the book of words, the book of words. 
Uh, in Mark chapter 12 and verse 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned, condemned. And we recognize uh, those that are condemned are those that have not believed on the name of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that will condemn them is the words that they spoke. Now, let me tell you something. God is concerned about the words that we say, right? And one of the things that we know from the Ten Commandments that is a sin is cursing. How many curse words have been muttered and uttered in this life? How many curse words have individuals said and spoken? And those words, not just those words, but those words also will be brought into account on that day and they will stand there condemned because of their words. And you know, we go into that situation and we think, you know, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good scenario uh, that plays out within my life. And yet if I, if I have every secret revealed, if I have every word that I've ever spoken, now whether it was a curse word or whether it was a, a, just a word of criticism against someone else or whether it was a lie that I should not have stated, I will be held accountable for that. This is what makes the blood of Christ so precious because it can cleanse me from these things. But if without it, I have no hope for cleansing. It's also, though, the most important book of all that's mentioned here is the book of life. The book of life. That's what he says there. He says then another book in the middle of verse 12 was opened, which is the book of life. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. When you consider here in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according uh, to uh, their works. As we consider again the final situation for all the lost, there is a, a, an aspect of resurrection. Resurrection, and this would be that final resurrection, if you will. What happens is we, rec we see here, based on this scripture, that the physical body will be resurrected. You know, we talk about that with us being saved and, and being raptured and the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? <clears throat> their physical body uh, shall, shall uh, unite uh, with their soul, but we also know that we'll also be changed into an incorruptible body. And those of us that don't die, I'm saying those of us, right? I'm considering myself in that position right now. Now tomorrow could be different, but those of us that haven't died when the rapture occurs, Listen, we'll also have that glorified body uh, when we're raised. But here, for the lost, their physical bodies are resurrected. Now, it's kind of interesting, and I don't know all there is to know about this, but many think that the, the, the lost, the physical body that they will have, will still be kind of a corruptible body. Now, there's going to have to be certain things that change because there's eternal, uh, an eternal aspect of where they will dwell and how they will live and those kind of things. Uh, but they won't receive that glorified, perfect body uh, that you and I, as saved individuals, will have. We see that by saying the sea gave up the dead. The sea gave up the dead. There's a physical body that will be resurrected at this moment. Now, where will it go? It will go before the judgment seat of Christ. All right? I'm sorry, not just you. It will go before the great white throne judgment where Christ will be judging uh, this multitude. Also, the soul, it says, hell delivered up the dead. Hell delivered up the dead. When we talk about somebody that dies right now without Christ, their body goes to the grave. Uh, their soul goes to a uh, hell. Now, hell is not the final resting place. If you know the scriptures and you think about it, it says death and hell shall be cast in two. So the hell is just the temporary holding cell for those that are lost without Christ. Now again, they've died, their soul has gone to hell. If you want a little insight into that, you can read Luke, I think it's chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken, Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man lifts up his soul, or eyes his soul in hell, and there experiences certain things, and there's some of the stuff that you can understand about that temporary dwelling place of hell. 
uh, this process here, it, it, in fact, it's kind of interesting because you can think about it just in the same kind of uh, illustration that we would understand in a current scenario in which somebody has committed a crime. They've committed a crime, so there the crime is committed. The, that's kind of like the death taking place of an individual. Then after you commit the crime, you're, you're uh, held in a, a holding cell. In fact, uh, I've been with the troopers and, and gone to uh, the Frederick County Detention Center with uh, uh, someone who broke the law, and they put them in a, a holding cell. And it's kind of an a interesting scenario to sort of uh, be a part of. And they're, they're put in there, locked. There's, certain things are taken from them, and then they're kind of held there temporary until... The trial, that's what's happened with the lost people. They've died, they've committed the crime, they've died, they've gone to hell, the remand or the, the temporary holding spot, and then, just like we know, you come and you stand trial. That trial is usually uh, several months, sometimes years, uh, after you've committed the crime, depending on the seriousness and how much time the uh, state's attorney needs to get all the information together, but eventually you will stand before a judge and be judged according to what you did. And then after the judge makes the, the guilty statement or the jury, then there is a sentencing and that person is cast then into prison if they're found guilty and they're sentenced for a certain number of years. That's the same kind of thing of what we're talking about here. This uh, uh, great white throne is the trial, and then the lake of fire will be that final prison, that final resting place of all the lost. And we see that in verse 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and that's what, that's what we recognize for those that are lost without Christ uh, that second death that will uh, occur. If you remember things regarding the lake of fire, and, 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 and I don't have time to really uh, uh, expand immensely upon it, uh, but there's, there's several things that we can just take note of. Uh, remember, first of all, hell and the lake of fire were created for the devil and his angels. As we speak and preach on a subject like this, there's certainly within every one of us a little bit of a, I don't want to say attitude, uh, but maybe that's part of what it is. There's the little bit of this like, Lord, why? Why would you allow this? Why would a place like this so exist? It doesn't, even, it doesn't need to exist. That's just not... We don't want a place of eternal torment, any place. I mean, why can't they just die and that be it? That'd be done. But this place of the lake of fire was created originally for the devil and his angels. It's mankind that messed it up. Mankind chose to sin. Mankind chose to disobey God. And I know they, Adam and Eve did it and we can blame them, but that doesn't excuse the daily decisions I make in regards to sin. And the daily decisions that everyone makes in sin. Considering the lake of fire, though, we must understand there's multiple warnings that have been declared. You know, we feel sorry for people. But at some point, people have been warned enough where you don't feel sorry for them anymore. You know, it's kind of like child training. It's hard for me in the first scenario just to deliver justice. But let me tell you something about the second, third, fourth, however many we go. I'm not feeling too sorry anymore. Maybe you didn't know the first time, maybe. But the second time, you did. And the third time, you just simply disregard. You know... God has given every individual multiple warnings. I think of it in one of the one of the I guess if it's a soft spot or a hard spot or if it's a, kind of both is for people, especially young people that have grown up in church in a church that's preached and taught the gospel and they're not saved. It's and it, and it, it, let me tell you something. I think it's more prevalent than we really want to admit. 
and I can, I can, I can say this, and, and I know I'm kind of stepping off the subject just for a second. If it can happen during the millennial reign of Christ, it can happen in a local New Testament church. Because I, by no means, am Christ. And I don't, I don't preach and teach like he would. I don't, I don't rule like he would. I know there's fallen in home, the same thing, the things that maybe they're experiencing at home. But we think, in our minds, here's what we think. We think, well, you've come to church, you've heard the gospel, you've prayed a prayer, therefore everything's good. And the fact that you can't live for the Lord, the fact that your life has no evidence of any kind of change or regeneration or whatever, you know what, it's fine, it, you said you're, no, no, it's not. True salvation changes a person. Become a new creature. And you know, those, those specific individuals, and, and, and this is the thing, I guess it just, kind of, like I said, it's soft and you're soft on one side of it and you're hard on the other side of it because it's like, you've heard it. You've heard it. You've been challenged with it. You may have gone through a Bible study. People have spent hours trying to explain to you salvation. You didn't get it. You didn't choose it. Part of me, I feel, I feel sorry because you had such a great opportunity to become a child of God. And the other part of me says, why did you spit on the gospel of Christ and choose your own life in order to get to that? The great white throne. And all of our mercy and the merciful, most merciful individual, we have to accept the fact that people have been more warned multiple times. This prison, this lake of fire is a place of torment and punishment. We read that in verse 10. When the devil is cast into there, where the beast, the false prophet are, it shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I don't make up the scriptures. The scriptures state the truth. If you can't accept the fact that there is an eternal place of, called the lake of fire, if you can't accept the fact it's an eternal place of judgment, then you can't accept the scriptures. That's, that's not my issue. That's not God's issue. That's your issue. You've got to come in agreement with the scripture. And I know there's people that like to stay away from that subject. The Bible doesn't stay away from it. I know there's people that like to, to change it and make it so that it's not really true. The Bible doesn't do that. We have no right to do that. The lake of fire is a real place of torment and punishment. It's a place of pain a place of pain, and it's an eternal place. It does happen. It does go forever and ever and ever and ever. It's, it's everlasting fire. The Bible describes it. Uh, the Bible describes it unquenchable fire. The Bible describes it specifically with the word forever. It's everlasting destruction. It's ever eternal damnation. In fact, in Mark chapter 3 and verse 29, it says, uh, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because if it doesn't change, eternal damnation is what they will experience. It's a place away from God's presence. That's probably one of the worst things of all about it. God won't be there. God won't be around. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of of his power. And again, I say these things. I don't say these things to scare you. I don't say these things to try to make you doubt whether or not God has really saved you. I say these things because they are true biblical principles that we must accept. And if we're lost, then yes, let it motivate us to deal with our sin the biblical way that God has stated. And if we're saved, then let it motivate us to stop being so consumed with our own selves and to consider the eternal destiny of those that die without Christ. And then we're too, we're too uh, scared or we're too uh, embarrassed to state something that might offend when we know what will happen for them forever. The word describing uh, this lake of fire is Gehenna. It's directly related to the Valley of Hinnon which was outside of the wall of Jerusalem. Essentially, that was the garbage dump for the city. There was a constant burning that took place there because everybody would take their trash and dump it out there and it would just be always burning. The stench, the dirtiness, the filth, the picture that you get of that is the same 
name that the Lord placed upon this lake of fire. Let me finish this morning here then with the final statement. The final statement, look at verse 15. Verse 15, take your eyes and put them on the scriptures. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 20. Here's what the Bible says. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So a couple different things that we can conclude directly from this final statement. And when I say final statement, I don't mean final statement in the scriptures. I mean final statement for the lost. The final statement for the unsaved before they enter into their eternal resting place of damnation and pain and torment in the lake of fire which burneth forever and ever. First of all here, whosoever, whosoever. What a wonderful truth that is found even in such a direct, harsh statement. Every individual has sinned against God, but every individual has been given a choice to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The whole doctrine of Calvinism based upon the fact of predestination to me is a stench in the nostrils of God. Because God specifically stated from the very beginning to the very end, listen, anyone that wants to come to Christ, anyone that wants to be saved has that opportunity. Yes, all have sinned, but all can come and confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and be saved. Whosoever will may come Amen. is the invite of the Scriptures. I love that aspect and I love that statement. I love that word and I'm glad it's part of this final statement for those that are lost that are going to experience the lake of fire. Everyone that stands there had an opportunity to be saved and could have escaped that great white throne of judgment. Then it says there and those that were not found written in the book of life. I told you I'd give you a little more about that book of life. That book of life has the name of every person that has ever been conceived in this world. Every individual, their name is written in that book of life, right? That's, that's it. That's the, way God has, that's the way God has designed it. That's the way God's created it. And again, I want you to think about this because it's God's will that all should come to the knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ, that none should perish. And he's demonstrated that in this book. I believe this, and, and maybe you'll correct me one day if you show me some the right scriptures, but here's what I believe at least right now. I believe that when you were conceived, your name was written in the book of life. And I believe God kept it there as long as He possibly could keep it there. And I believe that if you got saved and it forever, it was inked on that book. And nothing could erase it. Nothing could take it out of that book. Because our salvation is eternally secure in our God and in our Savior and the Holy Spirit. But those that died without accepting Jesus Christ... Their name was in that book, and it was blotted out. It was erased. It was removed from the book of life. And I think God keeps that book. And I think every time he has to blot a name out, he does it with such yearning, and love that it's almost like he wishes he didn't have to take it out let me tell you your name is in the book of life every one of us your name is in the book of life but the real question is will it be blotted out when you die only those whose names are there at this point of the end will experience eternal heaven forever and ever with the Lord. The Bible says that this is the second death. That second death is not cessation. That second death is separation. That's what the word death means. Separation. 
We see it at physical death when our body is separated by our soul. But we also see it in a spiritual death when we are separated from God by our sin. That's what Ephesians 2.1 says. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. But this second death that we're referring to is eternal death. It's separation from God forever in hell. Now I said it once, I'll say it again. If you're born once, you'll die twice. The second death. But if you're born twice, because that second birth forever Perm, makes your, your name permanent in the book of life. You will only die one time. Your body and your soul will be separated. But you will forever live with God. Listen. John 3.16, quote it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should not perish. Should not experience the great white throne of Jesus Christ. Should not experience eternal damnation in the lake of fire. But forever will have eternal life with our Lord, Savior, and our Heavenly Father. Where do you stand today? What is your needs? And what about those that you know that God so desperately loves that needs to hear this message? Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed.